Hey guys and gals, Nary here from Trick Queen Gaming. And some of you may on Twitter, the Gaming Drag. Today I'm coming back at you with a excuse me, let's play episode of Devil's Gambit. So yeah, let's go ahead and jump right back into it, shall we? Alarm chain, you were up. Let's go. All right. <clears throat> ah, sorry. He pats me on the shoulder before letting me go. I'll come around again tomorrow. Let's talk more then. I smile. I look forward to it. I'm surprised to find my room colder than when I left it. The first suspect is the window, but I remember to close it indeed. Must be because of the rain, I suppose, or maybe it's me. What lends credence to the latter's hy latter hypothesis is that laying under two blankets, one from the room and the other from home, doesn't help. Is it my flesh? It's not a fever, and I'm not and I'm not coughing or leaking from my nostrils. Maybe nerves then. Ah, I just hope it passes. Your journal entries have been unlocked. Oh. Huh. Act one, chapter three, Egan. Every day, people came and asked Dad questions. The whys and hows of a pain they had. Which herbs would help and how much they cost. Actually, let me look at the journal real quick. I'll do that after. Whether you skimmed your, skinned your knee or broke an arm or a leg, he'd patch you up. If you broke into a fever, a glance was all he needed to know what was wrong. It followed then that Duke Leopoldino, who became interested in a wolf boy afflicted by a mysterious illness, turned to Dad. It also followed that the day we arrived at the mansion behind our lavish room's closed door, he asked me why I lied. He fell down the sta- You fell down the stairs? At least I knew you are not lying off- Was his dad Egan? N yeah, his dad Egan. You fell down the stairs? At least I know you're not lying often because you're terrible at it. He knew even the things you didn't want to hear and had no trouble telling it all. When Grandpa was still alive, we had one of our fights. Later that night, Dad would talk again about the old tyrant of Oblin. That during his reign, he had asked for an education, and they would have laughed him off. If he tried to grab a scalpel, they would have cut that hand off. If he tried to run, they'd do away with a foot instead. That at my age, instead of spending his afternoons in a classroom, he was lost in a forest with trees made of cloth and a ground of mud and blood. Carrying a basin as his mud and blood-caked feet spatter, splattered the sinister mixture everywhere. He went around picking up viscera that had fallen to the ground. Rather than treetops, there were hands, faces, and hanging livestock. Among the faces, Dad sometimes found Grandpa holding a large red blade. However, that was nothing compared to what the tyrant let his men do to Aunt Nora and the other women while they were out foraging. Aunt Nora was also just a child back then. Was why this when this is why this became the breaking point. Grandpa and his allies turned their blades against the tyrant and let him taste what being livestock is like. Put the tyrant's head on a stick, his wife and children's too, and allow the new lord to rise to power. What? He did what now? He put the tyrant's head on a stick and also his oh, okay. He killed the tyrant's wife and children. All right then. Uh, all right, that's some Game of Thrones level shit right there. And thanks to that, Dad turned us into a family of doctors. Dad loved medicine. To right the wrong, set straight what was not, and set me straight he did. To think that he'd repay his efforts by telling a lie. I give him a Sean Connery accent. That Cadgan kid did this, didn't he? His grace warned me he'd be uncooperative. But he... I don't want to hear your excuses. Go to the lavatory and make yourself presentable. Clean your nose and take that and shake that dirt off. We're seeing our patient when you return. Yes, Dad. Our patient was Cadgan, which I didn't learn until we went into his room and found him sitting on the bed, hugging his knees and staring daggers at us. He didn't dare do anything with Dad and a guard there, but my father didn't approach him. He looked really he looked ready to jump at us, baring his fangs whenever Dad got too close. And while the guard kept us safe, his being there made it clear this wouldn't be easy. So we kept our distance at first. Dad retrieved his prismillium crystal and gathered magic in the palm of his hand. The crystal began hovering in front of him. At his request, I took his journal and got ready to take notes. The single eye, Dad looked at Cadgan through the crystal. It seems all right at a glance, and the prismillium isn't picking up on anything either. That lines up with what the Duke already knew. The crystal depowered, landed on his palm. Let's wait before we continue with this. In the meantime, Cadigan, I'd like you to answer some questions. 
Please don't be afraid. We are only here to cure you. Do you understand? First, how do you feel throughout the day? Do you notice any symptoms before or after you fall unconscious? All questions fell on deaf ears. Suddenly, Cadgan slumped over. Dad reached into his pocket for the green crystal. What is this? His life force is flowing outwards from one of the inner layers and bouncing all over the place. Nerves, bones, flesh, skin. All four layers were compromised. Irregular as it was, this didn't hurt Cadgan besides making him go unconscious around a specific time of the day. No matter how much we tried to wake him up, he wouldn't respond until his life force stopped running rampant. What it did was confuse Dad. He didn't know what he was looking at. He couldn't tell. No matter how many times he looked, how much he speculated, tried elixirs on the wolf, he couldn't understand or set it straight. Ian, he started anticipating the daily checkup. But that wouldn't be enough, no. Dad's confusion gave rise to a new greed within me that wouldn't be sated so easily. It's like, no. Despite how poorly our first encounter went, I would try to befriend Cadgan again. I figured more of those nuts he was eating would make a nice peace offering. In retrospect, that was one of my better ideas, wasn't it? New journal entries have been unlocked. Act 1, Chapter 4, The Five Layers. The fifth layer is going to be like mind or something. I can't narrow what motivated me to return to, Ren return to Renai down to a single thing. At first, <clears throat> excuse me, the money, obviously, but when the knight mentioned the town's name, homesickness overcame me. Not even the long travels of my father enlisted such a feeling. However, the Renai of nine years ago was gone. Dad isn't here. There's a new duke and the town has changed. Cadgan remains, but that isn't enough to shake off the cold. In the northwest section of town dubbed the Baron, the spread out shacks have been removed to make space for new houses and a hospital, though only a crude sign identifies the latter. The stables are where I remember them being, although no one is around yet. The rain did just stop. Rather than waiting to get a ride, I go to the Duke's mansion on foot, since it's not that far. On the way there, my thoughts shift to the new Duke, Manol. Many times I heard of him. He's become very well known in medicine in recent years. Both an accomplished surgeon and researcher, he's authored an enormous collection of journals on the bodies of many civilized species. His work is so all-encompassing, some consider it mandatory reading, no matter which discipline you practice. I snagged some of his works over the years, and I can attest there's some truth to that. His journal on boar saved my skin last summer when I had to treat one when I had to treat one on such short notice. Nothing can completely compensate for a lack of experience, but it's nothing short of amazing how much one can learn about people from faraway lands thanks to him. Not to mention he came up with some useful gadgets, such as my glasses. It's admirable that he's accomplished so much at his age, despite his circumstances, which is why the suffering he's caused to Renai makes me conflicted, and I wouldn't have returned if not for him hiring me. I don't know what to think. The mansion is as nice as I remember it except for the two guards stationed at the entrance. After explaining who I am, they let me in, and one of them escorts me to the Duke's study. Inside, it's as excessive as it was during Leopoldino's time, just with more bookshelves and shiny displays. What stands out is a sweet scent that I, didn't rec that I don't recall. Uh, some of it is herbs, wax, and oil. Uh, there's more that I can't recognize. We're already at the study's door, anyway. Please wait here. After a minute of staring at, por at a portrait of a sad-eyed lioness, the guard returns with an announcement. Dr. Hector of Oblon, Duke Manuel Leopoldo Sebastio Maria Jose Fiel Aregio Manuel Ricardo. He takes a deep breath. Restorico Gonzaga de Forinca, u Burgundia un Venicia. Well, now I'll see you. Jesus Christ, what a family name. As I enter the study where Dad and Leopoldo once held many private conversations, light hits me on the face. At around the 12 minute mark, y'all, I'm gonna start looking at those journal entries, so. Behind a wooden desk, a window at least twice a window at least twice as tall as I am overlooks the garden and separates the study from a balcony almost as wide as itself. Perfect for enjoying Renai's afternoon. To either side of the window are cabinets full of prizes, and above those, diplomas, many of which are written in what I can only assume are foreign tongues. The other walls are mostly occupied with diagrams, anatomic models, more bookshelves, and cupboards brimming with ornamented glasses and wine bottles. Oh, hello there. I find the Duke in the center of the room, working next to an operating table. My heart almost jumps out of my chest when I see what's on it. 
A vivisected wolf corpse with its guts and organs spilling out. The rib cage has been sawed apart, removed, and set aside. The legs missing, revealing precise surgical incisions. The flank cut open under its sickly tinted liver. There's no smell of ammonia nor the smell of death. The Duke looks at the liver intently, probing at it with a pen. Wax! It's all made of wax! What is it? Does your kind lack the gift of speech? Oh, uh... Gather your wits, Hector, and remember the proper greeting. I am Hector of Oblon. I am honored to be in your presence, your grace. The Duke places the pen on a tray and takes off his glove. He frowns at me. What are you? A sort of witch doctor? I hesitate before reaching into my belt bag and taking out one of my elixirs. I suppose so. I don't specialize in surgery, your grace, but I'm still a skilled healer. Allow me to see. He takes the elixir, inspecting it with the prismillium monocle he produces from under his coat. Then the lion nods, satisfied. Acceptable. And while returning the elixir, his eyes trail down to my belt. Is that the pair of prismillium glasses I spy? Indeed. That green tint is unmistakable. Duke Manol drags a finger across the monocle's metallic frame. It's one of my first designs, but I'm still quite proud of it. It utilizes copper as a conduit to more efficiently power the crystal, allowing you to activate it by gathering magic just on the tip of your fingers. It produces the strain on the user's eyes significantly, too. He clears his throat. Excellent. You are better prepared than it appears at first glance. Truly, doctors can come from any background these days. Thank you. What am I meant to do, then? He opens one of the desk drawers and takes a badge from it. His golden leg is noisy as he walks. Take this and head to the hospital. There you'll receive your instructions. You spotted the hospital on the way, yes? Indeed. Before I go, could you allow me to ask a question, Your Grace? He glances at the wax sculpture, but ultimately gives me the time of the day. I repeat in discreet terms what Cadgan told me and ask what he's trying to accomplish. Ah, so the wolves already told you about my expedition. It's wise of you to seek my side of the story. Those savages can't understand the greatness of my mission. Alright, y'all, let's look at the, take a look at the journal, shall we? Alright. Yeah, again. Oh, I like how it shows you there's stuff more stuff to read, okay. My childhood best friend, though we only saw each other for a few weeks every few months, and this was nine years ago, but still. He was one of Dad's patients. It's shocking how much he's grown up. He seems a bit more subdued now, but I suppose he mellowed out with age. He's a lumberjack and a peacekeeper? Anyway, he's become huge. Arwell. A dragon bartender. He manages a tavern called Arwell's Nest in Renai. He's very nice and has a smile that makes you feel at home. But I still am not sure of what I make, what I want, what I make of him. He definitely a recent addition to the town. I would have at least, would have at least heard about him had he lived here nine years ago. Sean. A wolf that Cadgan helped shortly after arrived in town. Despite being unable to work because of his injuries, a tax collector was trying to squeeze money out of him. What the hell is the Duke up to? Eugen of Oblan. My father. He was a very skilled doctor and taught me most of what I know. He passed away during a plague some years ago. Deep places. My hometown. Though small, it's a town of complicated history and tyrants of blood of tyrants and bloodshed. Perhaps because of this, the people here are used to enduring hardship. Dad loved Oblin, and he entrusted me with protecting it, no matter what. Renai. A misty town, which, much like a blonde, has a complicated history. I admit I'm ignorant of most of it, though. What I know, because the townspeople will eagerly inform you of this, is that it involves demons. The wolves have inhabited this land since the ancient times when there are no king when there were no kingdoms and everybody lived in tribes. Many invaders and kingdoms have tried to have tried to claim Renai, but they always end up leaving while the wolves remain. Arbel's Nest. Arbel's Tavern, as you can guess from the name. It's not too bad, thanks to the dragon's presence making it more homely than it would usually be. Let me uh remember the damn music volume. There we go. Okay. Back to the journal. Judging from the building, this place was a stable at some point. The Duke's Mansion. A mansion that looks more like a castle located deep in the forest. It's where I met Cadgan nine years ago. Nowadays, only the Duke, his guards, and some servants live here. It was built under Leopoldno's orders. I wonder what worried him so. The wolves or the demons? Maybe both. Magic. Herbalism. The science of brewing elixirs from certain raw materials. Most commonly, I already did that one. Prismillium. A semi-transparent green crystal which is commonly used to see life force, the magic contained within living beings. Anyone can gather some magic on the tip of their fingers and power a crystal, 
but it takes a professional to make sense of life force readings and make a diagnosis. All right, so I guess back to the game. It's like, no, I already saved it right there. So. All right. If it's wise, then why am I already regretting that I asked? Though my only choice is to listen now that I opened my mouth. No. He approaches a bookshelf and grabs a thick volume, holding it to show me its cover. Five layers. The foundational title, the basis of modern medicine. Do you know how old this work is? It was published in the second century. In the year 162, by an alchemist and healer named Karina making it 710 years old. In seven centuries, we have made little advancement in our understanding of medicine. What's more, the fifth layer, reason, remains a mystery to us. I intend to advance medicine by finishing Karina's work and unraveling the fifth layer's secrets. And you think the truth behind those secrets hides in, hides in the Eye Valley? I have reasons to suspect the Eye Valley will help me further this objective. If only that corpse would remain dead. Corpse. He sighs as he returns the book to its place. The demon, which shouldn't, yet does, exist. The Renai of nine years ago is gone, or once its demons were brought up with pride from an era long gone, or as mischief trying to scare an impressionable foreigner, now they are spoken about as though a present threat. Be it because of speaking of them lightly will incur the wrath of the Duke, or because they still do exist. Manol turns away, hiding the right side of his face. What are you staring at, Kerr? F forgive me, I wasn't expecting to hear that from you, Your Grace. Keep your eyes to yourself unless you want to lose them. Now enough of you! Away! By the time he waves me off, I'm already excusing myself. While I have learned what the Duke wants, I'm still baffled by questions about the Eye Valley, the Fifth Layer, and the Demons of Renai. However, you have work to do, Hector. Don't get distracted. All right, I'm going to go ahead and pause it right there. Thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, ring that notification bell, and check out our Patreon if you can. It always helps. Before I go, I'm going to give a quick shout-out to our lovely bronze tier patrons. Thank you all for all you do for the channel. We greatly appreciate your support. Thank you to our silver tier patron, Cade Silvermoon. Thank you for going a bit above and beyond. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you to our gold tier patron, Tresum Guy. You're awesome. We love you. Thank you for subbing to our ultimate tier. Anyway, if you all want to get your names in the credits, get access to all of our not safe for work contents as little as $5 already. I love you all, and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye bye